Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dewar and this is The Norman Invasion Part 13, The End of the Beginning. This episode is perhaps the most dramatic of all the shows in the Norman Invasion so far and certainly finishes on a cliffhanger. Part 12 left us as a Norman leader, Raymond de Gros, had just taken the town of Limerick while Rory O'Connor, Ireland's most powerful Gaelic king, agreed a treaty with King Henry II. Today's show opens in the aftermath of the sack of Limerick in 1175 as Raymond de Gros prepares to return to Dublin, but what waited for him there was most unexpected. Before I begin, I want to flag my crowdfunding campaign once more. There are only a few days left before it comes to an end this weekend, so this is your last chance to get behind and fund my upcoming book, 1348, A Medieval Apocalypse, The Black Death in Ireland. For those who contribute to the book, there are some really cool rewards. The one that might interest you most of all is the limited, hardback first edition of the book, of which only 100 are being printed. You can find out how to get your copy at irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash book. That address again is irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash book. As the winter of 1175 drew in, the kingdom of Thomond and its principal settlement, the town of Limerick, were in tatters. On October the 1st, a Norman army under Raymond Le Gros had stormed the town in bloody retribution for the actions of the King of Thomond, Donal O'Brien. As we saw in the last episode, Donal had attacked the Normans in 1174, but in October 1175, Raymond Le Gros had exacted a heavy price. However, the sacking and capture of Limerick was only one part of the woes sweeping through the southwest of Ireland that year. As Raymond Le Gros broke through the defences of Limerick in October, representatives of Rory O'Connor, the King of Connacht, were in Windsor, England, negotiating with representatives of the Norman King Henry II. The outcome was what became known as the Treaty of Windsor. Rory, who had given up trying to defeat the Normans militarily, had come to an uneasy agreement with them at Windsor. This was bad news for Donal O'Brien, as Rory increasingly acting in concert with the Normans, led his armies across the frontier and ravaged the Kingdom of Thomond. Caught between the two great forces of medieval Ireland, the King of Thomond, Donal, was quickly deposed. However, Rory O'Connor did not kill him, but instead, in accordance with Gaelic traditions, he had him exiled and then installed another member of the O'Brien family, the more pliable Morkad O'Brien, in his place. However, as Raymond de Gros placed his cousin, Milo of St. David, in power in Limerick and prepared to return to Dublin, he can't have been impressed by Rory's leniency. Had it been his decision, Donald O'Brien would no doubt have suffered a fate far worse than exile. Over the previous years, the Normans had executed several Gaelic kings who had double-crossed or risen up against them. Even if Donald's survival represented a potential problem in the future and an unsatisfactory conclusion to what had been an impressive campaign. Raymond de Gros had nevertheless yet again proven himself a great soldier. Indeed, he was undoubtedly the most popular Norman commander in Ireland and had been for years. Raymond's popularity among the Norman troops was such that they had mutinied when he left Ireland after a disagreement with Strongbow. In 1172, Raymond had sought the hand of Strongbow's sister, Basilia, in marriage, a proposal which was rejected by Strongbow. After this humiliation, Raymond left, but by late 1173, the troops were on the verge of mutiny and Raymond had to be recalled and was allowed to marry Basilia. Reaching such popularity and status was quite an achievement for Raymond, given he was younger than many of the Norman commanders in Ireland. Strongbow, for example, was in his late 40s, but Raymond was still only 35. Even aside from his age, though, he was not what we might imagine when we think of a dashing knight of the late Middle Ages. While his real name was Raymond Fitzwilliam, he was known 
as Le Gros, meaning the fat, due to his rotund appearance. However, if the character portrayed in the chronicler Gerald of Wales, flattering account of Raymond is anything to go by. He was a meticulous, down-to-earth commander who was the last to bed and the first to rise, always concerned for the welfare of his troops. Along with this, his record in Ireland was legendary by the mid-1170s. He had arrived in May 1170, fought at the Battle of Bag and Bun, then commanded the Norman forces at the Siege of Waterford. He had gone on to lead the defence of Dublin in the summer of 1171, among other notable campaigns. However, in spite of all this, Raymond was about to get the shock of a lifetime when he arrived back in Dublin to find himself at the centre of a storm of accusations and conspiracy. Raymond, along with his family, was accused of planning to seize control of Norman Ireland. But to understand this most serious accusation, we need to delve deep into the intertangled web of Norman families that were now in control of a large swathe of Ireland. By 1175, the Norman families in Ireland could be divided into three distinct factions. Hugh de Lacey, the Lord of Meath, led one faction. However, he had been absent from Ireland since 1173 and wouldn't return until the summer of 1177. The remaining factions and those key to events in late 1175 were the Declares and the Fitzgeralds. The senior Declares in Ireland were Strongbow himself and his uncle, Herbie de Montmorency, while the leaders of the Fitzgerald faction were the half-brothers, Morris Fitzgerald and Robert Fitzstevens. While these were factions, they were not necessarily adversarial all the time. They did come to each other's aid and fought alongside each other on numerous occasions. Nevertheless, they were bitter rivals when it came to sharing the spoils of conquest. In this web of rivalries, Raymond de Gros occupied a strange position. He didn't ally himself with his family, the Fitzgeralds. Morris Fitzgerald was his uncle. But instead, he had been one of Strongbow's chief lieutenants. However, no matter how much blood he spilled for the declares, Strongbow never forgot that Raymond, at the end of the day, was a Fitzgerald. This lingering suspicion had come to the surface when, as we saw, Raymond sought to marry Basilia, Strongbow's sister. This suspicion and tension around Raymond was no doubt fuelled in part by Harvey de Montmorency, who despite being Strongbow's uncle, had always played second fiddle to Raymond. Harvey no doubt desired to see Raymond fall. These rivalries and tensions explain why, when Raymond de Gros arrived back in Dublin in 1175, after his great campaign in the southwest, he was not greeted with laudits, but instead accusations from Herbie de Montmorency that he was plotting to take over Ireland and effectively overthrow the authority of Henry II on the island. When Henry II heard word of this, he took the matter very seriously and four royal officials were dispatched to Ireland. Two were instructed to stay in Dublin, while the other two were instructed to bring Raymond back to England and haul him before the king. We can only imagine the bitterness that Raymond must have felt as he waited through the winter storms of 1175 to 1176, knowing that once they lifted, he would be taken to England to face very serious charges. What role his wife's brother Strongbow had played in this, or what his views were, are not clear. It appears initially he did very little to help Raymond, and I find it pretty hard to believe that his uncle, Herbie de Montmorency, would have acted without Strongbow's authority. Perhaps the idea of having one less Fitzgerald in Ireland was worth the betrayal. However, if this was the case, Strongbow had completely underestimated Raymond's popularity. While accusing him was one thing, getting him out of Dublin was another matter entirely. While the ship to take Raymond to England was waiting on favourable weather, the Normans faced a new problem, one that revealed Raymond's importance. Word arrived in Dublin that Donal O'Brien had seized back control in Thomond and was besieging the Norman garrison of Limerick. Aid was urgently needed. Immediately Strongbow began to make preparations to lead the army south to Limerick. However, before he departed, the soldiers made it clear that they would not serve unless Raymond was in command. 
Their faith in Strongbow as a military leader was clearly wavering. Facing a mutiny with the besieged garrison of Limerick desperately needing aid, this was a most serious situation. However, for Strongbow, Raymond's popularity among the troops was now a clear threat to his authority. He needed to weigh up his options as to what was the most important thing to do, face down the mutiny or save the garrison of Limerick. In reality, in early 1176, he had little room for manoeuvre. If Limerick fell and the garrison were slaughtered, it would be a disaster, particularly if Strongbow had not even been able to try and relieve them. Therefore, he had to bow to the soldiers' demands and secure Raymond's release. He entered negotiations with Henry II's envoys and successfully got them to relent, granting permission for Raymond to lead the army to Limerick. While Raymond took command and the threat of mutiny abated, we can only imagine the tensions this debacle had caused among the Normans in Ireland. Strongbow's uncle appeared to have fitted up Raymond de Gros, and it's hard to believe Strongbow himself, at the very least, had done nothing to stand in his way. For Raymond, this was surely the ultimate betrayal. He had spent much of his life helping the Declare family, and this was the thanks he had received? Likewise, for his wife, Basilia, the deceitful actions of her brother and uncle against her husband can only have been a severe blow. Indeed, the tensions around this did not bode well for the future of the entire Norman project in Ireland. There is no way the Fitzgerald family would forget this act. Nevertheless, in 1176, these tensions had to be put to one side, momentarily at least. Raymond had to alleviate Donal O'Brien's siege of Limerick. Mobilising an army of around 600 Norman soldiers in Dublin, preparations were made for the march south. Raymond's host was joined by Gaelic allies, most notably Strongbow's wife Aoife's family, the McMurras of Leinster. This campaign to relieve Limerick is recorded in numerous sources, but they do differ slightly. Gerald of Wales, the only Norman source for the campaign, says that Donal, on hearing of Raymond's advance south, broke off his siege and moved significant numbers of troops to block the Norman advance at Cashel. With time to prepare the terrain, for an upcoming battle, Donald dug trenches and cut down trees, making a formidable defensive line across the roadway. However, even with these preparations, he could not withstand the Norman assault. Led by Mailer Fitzhenry, a close ally of Raymond de Gros, and a relation of the Fitzgerald family, the Norman cavalry yet again proved themselves too strong. They stormed the barricade Donald had erected, crashing through the defensive line. Defeat quickly followed for Donal, but he himself escaped with his life. While Gaelic sources do relay a slightly different chain of events, there's no questioning that the siege of Limerick was lifted in early 1176. Raymond Le Gros had secured Norman control of the town and his standing as a commander can only have increased. However, as the saying goes, winning the peace can be a lot more difficult than winning the war and Raymond in the aftermath was left to try and cobble together some arrangement, but first he had to navigate the tricky shifting alliances between the Gaelic kings of Ireland's south and west. While Raymond had defeated Donal O'Brien pretty easily in 1176, securing lasting stability in the southwest realistically meant including Donal in any long-term agreement. The previous year, Roy O'Connor had pushed Donal from power but it had only taken the deposed king a few months to raise an army and cause havoc by besieging Limerick. It was clear, a policy of keeping friends close and enemies like Donal even closer would work the best for the Normans. Donal, for his part, was probably a little more pliable than he had been in the past. Raymond de Gros had demonstrated Norman military superiority in blunt terms twice in the last few months. However, while Donal may have been willing to negotiate, Raymond also had to be mindful of other concerns. Any peace agreement in the South West had to factor in the Treaty of Windsor, signed between Henry II and Rory O'Connor in the previous year of 1175. In this agreement, Rory was recognised as the High King of Ireland, which effectively made him Donal's superior. Were he not included in any agreement, Rory's authority would be undermined and he would in all likelihood attack O'Brien, causing upheaval in the southwest. 
This situation saw three-way negotiations begin and a deal was cobbled together. The humbled Donal would remain King of Thomond. He and Rory O'Connor both then swore allegiance to Henry II and handed over hostages to Raymond as guarantees of their good behaviour. However, Donal then also recognised Rory as his superior within the Gaelic fold by handing over hostages. As this deal was sealed, it appeared the Treaty of Windsor might work as a template across Ireland. However, if anyone thought that this was a panacea to Ireland's problems of violence, war and conquest, they were sorely mistaken. Within a few months, it was blatantly obvious no treaty could hold back the dogs of war. This was not obvious because of events in the southwest, but instead when the Normans turned to settle the lordship of Meath. In accordance with the Treaty of Windsor, the Normans were to hold the territories of Leinster and Meath, and these were to remain free from Gaelic attack. While the King Rory O'Connor was willing to abide by the treaty, he had little influence over the Gaelic families in Ulster, in particular the O'Neill family of Western Ulster, who were increasingly worried about Norman encroachment into Meath, a territory close to their lands. Indeed, by 1176, the Normans pushed right up onto the northern frontier of Meath and the O'Neills, along with other families in Ulster, responded with massive force. They did not feel obliged to listen to Rory O'Connor or abide by his agreements with Henry II and the Normans. In a huge raid, they destroyed a castle built at Slain by the Norman Richard Fleming and according to the Annals of Tiernock, they killed 500 people. The annals of the four masters claimed there were many women and children amongst the dead, which would indicate these had been settlers, perhaps in and around slain. This attack clearly illustrated, though, that the Treaty of Windsor had limitations and Rory O'Connor could not enforce its terms in Ireland, spelling a troublesome future. Nevertheless, in that year of 1176, it did bring unusual stability to the south-west, as the region was ruled by kings who were all on good terms with the Normans. Indeed, when a feud within the McCarthy family, the rulers of South Munster, saw the king, Dermot McCarthy, deposed by his son, Cormac, the Normans were on hand to support Dermot, who was an ally of Henry II. When the deposed Dermot appealed to Raymond Le Gros, who was still in Nimerick, for aid, he was more than happy to oblige. In an uneventful campaign, Raymond reinstated Dermot and solidified the southwest, which was now ruled by allies of the Normans. Raymond's campaign, which was drawing to a close, had therefore been a great success. However, it was about to be overshadowed by something of far greater importance, which was both a blessing and a disaster for Raymond. While still in the southwest, Raymond received a somewhat cryptic message from his wife, Basilia. It read, Dearest, be it known to you, my true and loving husband, that that large molar which caused me so much pain has now fallen out. So I beg you, if you have any thought for your future safety or mine, return quickly and without delay. Raymond Le Gros immediately knew what this meant. His brother-in-law, Basilia's brother, the Earl of Pembroke, the Lord of Strigol and Leinster and the leader of the Norman invasion of Ireland, Richard Fitzgilbert de Clare, better known as Strongbow, was dead. The fallout from this would be immense. Tune in next time to see what happens. Until then, Sloan. <laughs>